All right, it's on. So thank you for joining us today, the end of day two of uh, GovCon 2024. Hi, I'm Krista Travada. This is Rick Cisneros. Cisner Cisneros. We are from IQ Solutions. Um, IQ Solutions is a public health communication company that uses Drupal as uh, part of our offerings. We have eh, 20 developers and a probably about 60, 60 sites we manage across different platforms. Um, so today we are here to talk about uh, Drupal security and how to make it simple. This is a intermediate type discussion. We're not going into code here. This is uh, you know, good for people who are developers, but also good for people who aren't. So we're gonna try to make security less scary than it used to be. So we're going to talk about the basic security principles, what the vulnerabilities are. These change regularly, but we're going to cover what they are in 2024. The types of hackers, what they want from you, what they're trying to uh, get out of you, and how to keep Drupal secure. Um, so first, let's cover some security myths. So first thing is, oh, I don't accept, and I've heard all of these, I don't accept credit cards online, so I don't need to worry. That's false. Uh, I don't care if somebody cyber squats on my website as long as they don't use too much bandwidth. I'm moving in and out. I don't like that. As long as I don't use too much, they don't use too much bandwidth. That's false. Uh, you can only get viruses or malware from shady areas of the web. That's false. Uh, security through obscurity. So if you think you're not interesting enough for someone to hack you, you're probably wrong. That guy in number two is looking for you. Um, I don't have anything worth stealing on my site. There's always something somebody wants. And all I need is an SSL certificate that makes me secure. That is false. A few years back when SSL turned up on everything, I was kind of worried that was going to give people a false sense of security, but there is more to security than just an SSL certificate. Although it is important in specific situations. So let's talk about the truth now. Um, Security is a system. It needs to be built using a holistic approach. It's not one thing you do, it's everything you do. Security of your system and protecting your company's data is paramount, it is important. Um, everybody, you know, you, you, we can all name probably the last five hacks that happened. What was the uh, most recent one was the Cloud Strike one. That was, I think, the most recent one. There was an AT&T one last week or so ago. So it's always something, uh, isn't it? Security includes the audit of people, process, and technologies. You are going to hear us mention those three things throughout this thing. All those things are used to build your software. All those things need to be tested and um, monitored to make sure that they are um, operating fully. And of course, humans are the biggest risk because, well, the phone rings, something happens, and you walk away, and you come back, and now you're two steps ahead. And you missed two steps, and that's where the hacker got in. Uh, the cost to fix this stuff is always going to be more than the cost to implement it properly from the start, and the PR damage can be irreparable. I think it's not as bad as it used to be. People used to get so alarmed, but it is still bad. Um, so let's talk about OWASP. So OWASP is a open web application security project. They're a nonprofit, and their mission is to make security visible. Uh, one of the primary things OWASP does is every year they publish the top 10 security threats. They tend to stay the same for two or three years and then they'll switch and change and new ones will come in and things will move up and down. So it is something you have to kind of keep track of. Their job is basically just making sure that people understand security and make the right decisions. Um, and I mentioned this before, but this holistic approach to, to security to security and privacy is a process, not a product. It's something you have to think about through all the phases of design. You know, if cars were built like software, we'd all ride the bus. We wouldn't be getting in the cars and uh, driving them so much. So uh, let's talk about the principles. So we talked about the people, process, and technology. Um, testing is the most important part of an effective security testing and it should include testing the people, so making sure your people are aware that they know how to, so how to write code in a manner that's secure, that they know uh, all the 
processes you have in place to make things secure. The processes, making sure that you have policies and standards that people have to, that those people, those people can follow, and making sure you're using secure technology, making sure you're updating it. So, once it's, if you don't adopt this holistic approach, then just trying to manage software and, and do security updates is not going to be enough. Um, there is no silver bullet, so we like to think that you know just having a, running a scanner or doing something like that is all we need. But again, it has to be all of the different parts that have to be uh, secure: your people, your processes, and your technology. Um, you have to have a development life cycle. So a lot of people, you know, you write code, you push it up to the internet and just kind of cross your fingers. It's not really a, a great way to necessarily do things. You need to have a, a life cycle in place where you go to a development server, you do all your testing and stuff there, where you have a staging server that mimics where you can do testing uh, and things like that. And you need to uh, be able to do some threat modeling and other techniques so that you can uh, assign appropriate resources to the system. Um, and the software life cycle is king. So making sure that you think of security through all the different parts. So as you're defining the system, when you're deciding what this is that you're going to build, what are the security implications of it? Is this a five-page HTML site or is this a you know 10,000 page Drupal site with a database back end? That's totally, you know, totally different scope of security, but understanding what the scope is, understanding in these really large sites what the areas are that are the most vulnerable and where you have to be able to um, test those. So each phase of this has considerations and you need to always be um, throughout the entire cycle thinking about security. Um, test early, test often, just like functional bugs, if you find them early, they are cheaper to fix in the end, right? So if you find something early, it's cheaper to fix. Once it's out there, you, you have a, it, it makes it harder. Now it's under, you know, it's under pressure and everybody's working overtime to get it fixed. Um, and understanding the scope, like I said, is this a five-page site? Is this a, uh, you know, 10,000-page database uh, site? How many people can log in? Is it only people that work with you? Is log in behind a VPN? All of these things matter, and you have to understand, understand the scope of that. Um, and then what compliances do you need? Do you need HIPAA, protecting sensitive data? Um, we all, a lot of us here in DC, we have all kind of compliances we have to follow. We hope that our wonderful clients do uh, make sure to share, share all the information they have with us so that we can do that right for them. All right, and developing the right, right mindset. So, you know, when you, if you're a cop and you're trying to catch criminals, you have to think like a criminal. If you're trying to maintain a system of security, you have to think like a hacker. So what are these people after? What, what do I have on my website that I offer that they might want to get to? And how, and what, 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 uh, what, what, what avenues have I given them to get there? So making sure you know and understand all that is important. Um, and then using the right tools. So there are tools that you can use. There is not one tool that will solve everything for you. So making sure you understand the tools that are available, what they do, and how to use them, and, and what they can offer, and then how to read the results. A lot of times, I get a, you know, a, a report that's, you know, 50, 50 issues that are wrong with, that, uh, that come up on it, but the reality is three of them are are, are actually accessible, and so being able to to understand that is important. Um, and the devil is in the details. So making sure, like I said, that you go through every one of those 50 and understanding what they are before you decide they're um, uh, false positives or if they are something you really have to deal with. Um, making sure you understand all of the different uh, logic and that you've tested everything and reviewing the findings and, and, uh, and weeding out all that. So it's all about the details. Um, and then use source code when available. So code reviews are cool. Um, source code uh, for Drupal is usually out there. We can all see it, right? It's all been, a lot of it has been peer reviewed and it's been, you know, you can look on a Drupal module and see if it's uh, got the security check boxes, check marks on it or not and determine if you want to use it. If it's something that, that you know, has, isn't being maintained, you probably want to try to find a better way, but then writing custom code is always a, uh, a, a whole other black box of, of uh, 
possibilities. So just making sure you that you do use the you know do use source code and you do use code reviews. There should always you should never put code on the internet that only you looked at. There's somebody else should look at it. There should always be a second set of eyes on it at least. Um, and then developing matrix, knowing what you've what you've done, where you're going, kind of how many bugs did we have last month, how many did we have this month, are we getting better, are we getting worse, and how to adjust to that. Um, there's some links in these slides as we go through. You can, the OWASP has uh, templates that you can download for a lot of this. I'll upload the slides to the GovCon website after the presentation so that you guys can get the links that you need to in here. Um, so we wanted to make sure we develop matrix and document the results. So knowing kind of how things, how things are improving or how they're getting better is going to be very important and making sure to document the results. With security testing, just like any other testing, a lot of times you think you're gonna remember, but you don't. So having test cases that say past failed, what failed, how did it fail, and how did you fix it later is increasingly valuable to you later on. So that kind of covers the kind of the principles of testing. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the type of hackers, and I'm gonna let Rick talk about this. So thank you guys, and Rick, talk about the hackers. Hey, how's everybody doing? Um, today we're going to, well, I'm going to move on to types of hackers and their motives. Uh, we'll start off with ethical and malicious hackers. Uh, an ethical hacker is usually employed by an organization who trusts him or her to attempt to penetrate networks or computer systems using the same methods as a hacker for the purpose of finding and fixing computer security vulnerabilities. An authorized hacking is a crime in most countries, but penetration testing uh, done by the request of the owner of the victim system or network is malicious hacking. Why do hackers target sites? Uh, well, it basically goes into three categories. You got uh, demographic data and access for three reasons. Uh, to use your computer to steal the services, uh, valuable data uh, for the thrill and excitement to get even as a publicity stunt to set up a malicious commerce sites. Uh, for knowledge, experimentation, uh, curiosity, the prestige, bragging rights, uh, intellectual challenge, money or financial gain, and engage in various forms of credit fraud. fraud. Professional uh, cyber criminals are the biggest group of malicious hackers. Uh, they use malware and ex exploits to steal money. Um, doesn't matter how they do it, it basically comes down to how they, they can get into your bank account uh, for quick financial gain. You got spammers and adware spreaders. Uh, the purveyors of the spam and adware uh, make their money through legal advertising, either by getting paid by a legitimate company or pushing business their way by selling their own products. Uh, members of this group tend to believe that they're just aggressive marketers. Advanced persistent threat agents. Uh, intruders in, engaging in APT style attacks represent a well-organized, well-funded, and often located in a safe harbor country. Uh, they are out to steal a company's intellectual property and they're out for, and they aren't out for a quick financial gain like cyber criminals. They're in it for the long haul. Uh, they dream, their dream assignment is essentially duplicate their victim's best ideas and products in their own homeland or to sell the information they prolonged uh, to the highest Bitter. This group has continually getting better, stronger, and bigger, and is expected to top the charts this year, according to all the predictions. Uh, this is the new arms race. They steal from governments and businesses alike. Malicious, uh, excuse me. Uh, corporate spies is the next group that we're going to talk about, and uh, it's not new. It's just significantly easier to do thanks to today's per pervasive internet uh, connectivity. Corporate spies usually are interested in a particular piece of intellectual property or competitive information. They differ from APT agents in that they don't have to be located in the safe harboring country. Uh, corporate espionage groups are usually as organized as APT groups, and they're more focused on the short-term to middle, uh, mid-term financial gains. Hacktivists, uh, lots of hackers are motivated by political, religious, experiment, environmental, and other personal beliefs. Uh, they usually are content with embarrassing their opponents or defacing their websites. 
although they can slip into corporate espionage mode if it means that they can weaken the opponent. Think of WikiLeaks or Anonymous. Cyber Warriors is a city-state against a city-state ex is uh, basically going after city-state and city-state. Um, think of country, think of North Korea um, and the United States. Uh, basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to disable a military opponent's capability. Rogue hackers are hundreds of thousands of hackers who simply want to uh, prove their skills, brag to their friends, and are thrilled to engage in unauthorized activities. They may participate in many types of hacking, uh, but it isn't their only objective or motivation. Uh, these are traditional stereo these are like what are traditionally stereotyped uh, figures popularized by the, 18 the 1983 film War Games. Uh, hacking late at night while drinking Mountain Dew and Dorito eating Doritos. Uh, these are petty criminals in the cyber world. They're more of a nuisance, but they aren't about they aren't about to disrupt a, a company or organization. Uh, all crimes, even cyber crimes, have three things. Motive, means, and opportunity. Now that we know how the motive, let's talk about means. Well, I can just flip this slide. Um, attackers could potentially use many different paths through your application to do harm to your business or organization. Uh, each of these paths represent a risk that may or may not be serious enough to warrant attention. This thing's all crazy right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's go talk about the WASP Top 10, um, which basically focuses on identifying uh, the most serious risk. Uh, they use a simple formula of risk is equal to likelihood times impact. But you're the only one that really knows the ins and outs of your application or your business. Uh, so only you can really assess those, those risks. This chart right here uh, shows the different things to consider when evaluating your risk and potential vulnerability. Attack vector is how easy or hard is it to exploit. Uh, Weakness prevalence is how common or widespread. Weakness detectability is how easy is it to detect. Technical impact, how will the organization be affected in the event of a specific vulnerability being exploited. For each vulnerability, a risk assessment should be completed. Most of the ones are on, that are in the top 10 are actually uh, taken care of with some Drupal modules and, and uh, pretty much core. So this is the WASP top 10. Um, as of right now, I think, I think it changes every four or five years. Uh, but here we have broken access controls being the biggest one. Uh, cryptographic failures, injection and secure design, security misconfiguration, vulnerable and outdated components, identification and authentic authentication failures, software and data integrity failures, security logging and monitoring failures, and server-side request forgery. We're going to go into like three of them. Uh, so we're going to talk about broken access control first, which is the process of determining who can access what information and resources within a system. Uh, it involves identifying users, authentication, their identities, and authorizing their actions based on predefined rules and permissions. Broken access controls when users are able to access resources they shouldn't. This can lead to data exposure, modification, or even deletion. So improper role assignments can cause this. Um, incorrectly assigning permissions to users can uh, grant them authenticated access, unauthorized access. Uh, custom module vulnerabilities can cause it. Um, custom modules might contain flaws and access lo the control logic. Session management. Uh, Weak session management can lead to session hijacking and unauthorized access. Data exposure can expose sensitive data unauthorized users do, due to insufficient access controls. So how do we fix it? Well, Drupal uses, utilizes, or this is how you fix it. Uh, permission system, utilize Drupal built-in permission system effectively. 
uh, custom permissions, define custom permissions when necessary, ensuring proper enforcement. Entity access, control access entities using Drupal's entity access system. Menu access control, uh, manage menu item visibility based on user roles, and perform regular audits. audits. I'm going to give it over to Krista for the next section here, injection. All right, very good, thank you, Rick. All right, so let's talk about A3 injection. So basically, that's uh, when people can do what it says, injects things into your data. So whether it's using a URL or using a form to um, put things into the database to make it do what they want it to do, not what you want it to do, um, that is the A3. So the, <laughs> the best way to know if a website is does it allow users to find input? So do you have forms that are allowing users to put um, things in? This is where things like your uh, your uh, input filters and stuff in Drupal will help you, right? Limiting what people can, who, who can enter what information into your database. Um, so Drupal core on its own has a, a, an API that will make it difficult for this and then there's some Drupal modules that we can, we'll talk about we can use to guard against this. And then um, security misconfiguration is A5. This one bounces around, it goes up and down on the chart. Um, the thing about this is this a lot of this comes to how you configure the server it doesn't necessarily or the server and the application it doesn't necessarily come down to uh, write the, the code that is written although like you were saying you, you have to write the access controls and the code right but it comes down to just is your server configured right there's ports that can be closed you're not using defaults you're not leaving default users in systems that shouldn't be there things like that so uh, making sure that you clean up, uh, up that. Um, and uh, Drupal does, it does provide a good system for this. Proper setup is necessary though. So it's just always making sure that you're going through and reviewing the settings that you have. Um, make sure you have a repeatable hardening process. So all of your sites should at the base be set up the same way. You should have a set of security modules, a configuration that you use for all of your servers and, and keep everything maintained and updated. It'll keep your sanity. Now granted, in, in, in our world, sometimes that's not possible because one client uses one thing and another uses another, but you can, uh, you can usually manage that. So trying to keep things as, as consistent as possible will help you. Um, keeping uh, uh, updated on all of the new updates and everything that come out. Having a strong architecture and then running scans periodically used to do work for Pfizer. We were not allowed to move code to a server until it had been scanned on the previous servers. I think everybody should do this and they don't. So if you don't do that, you should. Um, there's a lot of different scanning tools you can use out there. Um, so let's go through the uh, Drupal and OWASP. So these two, table, these two tables I'm going to show you next are really handy. I'm not going to go through every single line on this because I am going to upload these slides and you will be able to see it. And we are going to talk about a few of them. But basically, these two tables just kind of aligns which modules you can use in Drupal to make sure that each one of these is mitigated against. So it's broke up into two tables, uh, uh, a, a five, 1 through 5 and 6 through 10. and. Uh, but we're going to talk about them in a minute in more detail. So we're going to spend a scan those. Um, and then we have some testing tools. So if you go to Olibos, they have this app penetration tool, which is a free testing tool and Vega scanner. Um, making sure you have a firewall set up. There's a software called CF, CSF. And what it does is it just gives you kind of a nice user interface to be able to uh, manage all of the security settings that are on a server. So instead of going through and digging through text files, trying to figure out what you have to change, it kind of gives you some information. It gives you all the information in one place. Um, and then Nessus Scanner, I think that one costs money. I think there might be a free version, but that one uh, does the modern scanning. So whenever you deploy your code, you should always be scanning it. Um, and so basically what we learned, protecting from vulnerabilities is a must. The tools cannot do it all. Manual testing and attention to detail is necessary. It's multi-layered, so you need to make sure your application is secure. You need to make sure your server is secure. All the different layers need to be taken care of. It is a process, not a process. 
complacency and human beings sadly are our biggest threat. So just making sure we do our due diligence and OWASP does create, uh, have some great resources. So the last part here we're gonna talk about is securing Drupal and uh, what, what, uh, what could, which modules you can use to uh, add to your basics to, to make sure that you're securing Drupal. So here's a list of them and we're gonna talk about kind of each one of these. So security review, input filters, star bikes, that's in core, some of these might have been linked to core, automated log out, uh, making sure that you don't let people just stay logged in forever as much as we all just wanna stay logged in forever. The other thing is, you know, doing single sign-on. So making sure you use SAML or some other tool like that to log only in people when they're on other resources is helpful. With CAPTCHA and ReCAPTCHA and Honeypot, protect your forms, keep uh, from injection and things like that. Security kit, session limits, and username and numeration prevention, which is actually in core now, but didn't get moved off of this slide uh, this time. So that's been moved to core. Um, let's talk about each one. So security review, security review is actually a really nice module. It goes through and it just kind of gives you a report, kind of like your status report on what your what security things you have configured, what you don't, and where, where you need to improve. So it's a nice one to have on there. It doesn't have a lot of overhead and it's, you install it, it's on. So there's not a lot, a lot to it from the perspective of uh, using it. Um, input filters, so this is part of core. These are actually really important and, Sometimes I wonder if people understand how important they are. Uh, but when you first install Drupal, usually you have, I think, plain text filtered in full HTML that you can set up and then you can add all kind of editors. Um, and this is basically limiting what people can pump into a form, right? You don't want to be letting people punch a, pump in a bunch of JavaScript or code or anything like that. You want to limit what they can do in there. You want to make sure that they're not bringing in content and things from other sites. You're not putting scripts in there that are going to um, do malicious things to your database. So I'm really looking at these. If you change them from out of default out of the box, they should be configured relatively well. If you keep filter full HTML limited to people you know and filter kind of uh, to people you don't, you'll probably be okay out of the box. But it is a really important configuration that you set up. Um, automated logout, and that's just, again, making sure you know, somebody logs into your site at a coffee shop and doesn't log out, so the next person who sits behind them is going to be logged in and be able to start changing things. So, you know, it's, a, it's an odd use case, but, you know, it's possible. So making sure that people get logged out after a certain amount of inactive time, and then using CAPTCHA for spam, recaptcha, honeypot, all of these things, CAPTCHA and ReCAPTCHA kind of put the, uh, put it on the user to, to, to put in a code to get through. Honeypot's a little less invasive to the user, but I think it doesn't give people the warm sense that they've, they've done something to protect their form because it's so uh, behind the scenes. But basically, it, it puts in a fake form field that, that uh, and if, you, if a bot, when a bot comes through, it'll fill out the fake form field, and that's how they get caught. Security kit helps with injection. Um, session limit we talked about, just limiting basically how many, how many different computers can I log into. Can I log into one computer or can I have three different sessions on three different computers? Best thing to do is probably to bump people out when they log in somewhere else. But if you have automated logout out set up, you shouldn't have to worry that much about that one. Um, username enumeration prevention. So basically when you Put up error messages when a user can't log in. Don't give away the half the key, right? So don't give away what their username really is. Drupal moved this into core, I believe, in uh, D9. So there used to be a module for this. I don't think we need it, but if you're writing code in a way that does display usernames, you want to be careful to not display that information. And then here's some other security modules. Just generate passwords. Logging and alerts. Logging and alerts is a good one. If all of a sudden you get a server and it starts sending gigabytes of data to Russia and you get an email, you can probably stop it. And that was actually a real world scenario. So, um, MD5 check password policy, making sure that people can't use password one, two, three, or things like that. I do find this insanity of changing your password every 90 days. I don't know that that's doing much for us, but that tends to be one of these policies, I think it could probably be named out to a little less frequently, but that's me. 
uh, flood control. So if somebody tries to log in over and over again, making sure that they get blocked. Uh, content security policy and security kits. So content security policy lets you allow content to be brought in from other sites or not. In most cases, you probably don't want site but content brought in from other sites because you can't control it, but I imagine there are use cases for it. Um, so that is, oh look at that, I had a slide for each one of those, and we talked about them all. I, I winged it there on those, how, how about that? Where are we at time on this? We are at 4.32. Um, making sure you update, keep all, Drupal, I think, what is it, the first Tuesday of every month they release the uh, security updates and stuff, so making sure you keep up with that, knowing when your modules need to be updated and making sure that you update them, and making sure that you don't just worry about the contrib and the core, that if you have custom modules and vulnerabilities come out, that you look at your custom modules for anything that they might, um, for any weaknesses they might have, it, have. Um, and then Drupal best practices, there's a link on here too. Never hack the core, so I'm assuming most of you guys know that, but don't go in and don't hack core, mod core modules, don't hack core code, don't hack contrib modules, write a patch instead. Um, if you start hacking them, then you can't update them, and then everybody's telling you, no, no, you have to stay on Drupal 7 for the rest of your life, and, and there you are. Um, avoid hard coding, in most cases Drupal has a way you can do things without it, so avoiding that. Um, use test sites, like I said, don't ever deploy code that hasn't been tested and scanned and everything, so making sure you have a dev, a QA, staging site set up so that you can, uh, you can test these things before they go out to production. Avoid too many modules. If you are doing, uh, trying to figure out how to do something and you install six modules and you actually only use three of them, get rid of the other three, uninstall them, move them out of the way, make them go away, because otherwise you have to maintain those things and nobody wants to do that and never hack the core. Um, did I mention never hack the core? All right, zero day vulnerability. So basically this is a, important to understand, it's basically when we find out something is a threat. So all of a sudden the site gets hacked, we find out how they got in and that becomes a zero day vulnerability. And that means that every site kind of out there is potentially at risk for this until you evaluate it. So understanding when these are, um, when these come out and how to address them and making sure you keep up on that is really important. Um, Open source software. So basically, the back in the day, we code used to be kept like really secret, and it wasn't as it wasn't. It was a little bit different. We had code names for everything. It was weird. Um, now it's most of the software is out there, and you can you can you can see it. So back in the day, we felt like if if your code was secret, that it was somehow safer. And I don't even know if that was true. But right now, but the way it is now with like, especially Drupal, all that code is out there. Anybody who wants to can see how it's coded and can, can find ways to work around it. So always make, you know, making sure to just be aware of that, 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 that you know, there's no secrecy in this, that it is open source software, that anybody who wants to can figure out how to code against it. Um, and then just maintaining strong, strong security. So making sure that you're maintaining everything, making sure you're staying informed, um, making sure that you're ma uh, keeping track of where your updates are. We do a regular ticket once a month to do, you know, check on, this, on modules, what needs to be updated on everything that automatically come to me so that I have to go and check everything. And some months they're annoying because some months I don't need them, but every month they come and I know that, and, and it does force me to check them. So I'm just making sure that you maintain that process. Um, applying your security updates. Uh, so it's, you know, like I said, you want to do these on development environments, but as of Drupal 7, you could start like actually literally going in and clicking a button and saying update this module. I don't know that I actually would uh, propose that as a great way to do it, but at least it can be done if, if somebody needed to. So that's kind of the useful thing. Um, be careful with contributed modules you're using. Some do conform, some are monitored by Drupal security team, other ones aren't, and they tell you right on the module. So watch those. I also say be careful of ones that have low usage but big years. So if something that came out this year has low usage, that's to be expected. Something that's been a module since, say, 2006 
but is low usage, that is one you maybe want to be a little suspicious of, but then you have to decide between custom code and modules, and so there are these decisions that you need to make, understanding that you always have to manage and monitor that custom code. Um, as far as Drupal and the state of Drupal security, I think it is, is now, and since about 2015, was deemed as kind of the most secure of the CMSs out there. The other ones, you know, they, they, they do it, but Drupal has a good uh, process that they do. Everything goes through security uh, reviews and things like that. So they were, even back in 2015, I think by the FBI and stuff, it's, it's the one to, to make sure you were using on these things. Um, and just like I said, the most important thing that I want you guys to take away from this, everything else considered, is that this is a process. This isn't something you do overnight. This isn't something you do one time. This is something you do as part of your software development process. This is something that you include in everything you do in every aspect of what you're doing. And it'll be much easier and you will have much more success. And that is the end of our presentation. My, our emails are on here. I said I will upload this slideshow. I'm not a microphone girl. Um, I'm going to turn off the recording. And if uh, anyone has questions or wants to talk, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, and then you can all go home. <laughs>